Pam and Buddy and Julia, it's good to see you. How's, I asked this morning, has that storm gotten your way? Uh, I noticed you had rain the other day, and I noticed that storm's getting pretty big. Do you know they named that hurricane after my eldest daughter? It's Hurricane Laura. Just to pass on that little bit of information. If you have any prayer requests that we don't have, we encourage you to go ahead and type them on and pop, the, pop them onto the comment section and reaction section of, uh, of the screen. So uh, many of you know how to do that. And we will be beginning this evening. I sent out a, uh, a letter and an article uh, last night. Many of you have gotten it. I've, uh, uh, you know, so I just want to encourage you. That is not a call to go out and confront people and demonstrate and take down government or anything. That is a call to prayer because that's what we need to do. That's where this battle uh, for the very heart and soul of our nation uh, will be won. It will be won in prayer, you know, before God, taking down the strongholds that, uh, that exist until Christ, uh, his glory fills all of this nation. In fact, the whole of the earth. We are called to pray. We are called to tear down in prayer those strongholds bring down in even in our own life any imagination or lofty thing or speculation that's raised itself above the very knowledge of god it was pointed out to me by a dear loving brother that uh you know maybe some of these people that are making decisions are doing it because they're generally concerned about the people and i don't doubt that uh, and as i pointed out paul felt he was always doing the right thing uh, before he met Christ as well. Uh, Well-intentioned, I have no doubt, but there's a backside of that that the enemy wants to use to silence the witness, to silence the believer, to impair the church. We need to pray not against governors and mayors and, and, and uh, senators and, and representatives. We need to pray against the power uh, of, of, of the authorities of wickedness and evil in, in heavenly places. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, what I would need, Pam, is your email address. Uh, I don't have that. That's why you're not on that list. So if you could get it to me, I would put you on the email address and make sure that you get it. All right, let's move on as we uh, continue with our study and a look at somebody new, somebody that I heard about a number of years ago from Avery Willis. They were in Indonesia uh, 
Uh, Avery was beginning in Indonesia and was there for the uh, for the last five years of this person's ministry in Indonesia. He wasn't with the uh, International Mission Board. He and his wife were with regions uh, beyond, but they knew each other because of their work together in Indonesia. And the neat thing about foreign missions, all uh, always, is that uh, that there most of these barriers that we have denominationally come down once you get on the mission field, and everybody loves and supports one another. Uh, okay, Mark, Louisiana down. Uh, Julia's saying yes, they're getting hit. They're getting hit pretty hard. Uh, please pray for 98-year-old uncle. He came down with the virus. Absolutely. If there's anybody that's at high risk, it's this gentleman. So we will put that person out there as well. Uh, Julia says she has an unspoken request. You get piling them on. We'll be going to prayer in just a moment after I share this story. Uh, in the book, Peace Child. Uh, and you can go out and get a copy of it and, and see it. It tells the story of Don and Carol Richardson, who spent 15 years among the Sawi uh, people of Papua, Indonesia, Papua, Papua, Indonesia. Don was born in Charlottetown, Prince Edward uh, Island in Canada in 1935. He was 17 years old when he dedicated himself to the Lord at a Youth for Christ rally. Uh, at this point on, Don began wholeheartedly to pursue God's missional call for his life. Uh, he married his wife, Carol Joy, and they graduated together from Prairie uh, Bible Institute in Alberta, Canada, which has turned out some tremendous preachers and, uh, and, and others and missionaries. In 1962, Don and Carol and their seven-month-old son moved to Papua, uh, Indonesia, uh, with Regions Beyond Missionary Union. Uh, it's now called World Team. Uh, their unwavering commitment was to this cannibalistic tribe called the Sawi. Uh, and their, their love for them transcended the uh, fierce opposition that would, uh, would come along with living among them. Uh, in the early 1950s, many of the tribes in the jungle of Indonesia were totally unevangelized and virtually untouched by the outside world. Uh, though primitive, they were a highly intelligent people and they developed a lot of skills for surviving in the jungle, and along with a lot of legends and elaborate rituals that uh, ha were, were rife with meaning that uh, had developed over the years. The Sawi were headhunters. They were cannibals, and as were many of the other tribes in the region. But the door, Lord opened the door for these people to accept the missionaries through their thinking that at first the white people were... Uh, uh, you know, were, were something different. They weren't quite human. Uh, were spirit, but they weren't human. And they called them the, the Tuan. And their curiosity uh, of the Sawi uh, began to grow. They'd heard rumors that the Tuan could shoot fire. That's speaking of guns. And they readily accepted the gifts that the missionary brought, some of which were uh, axes, which could bring a tree down in like four strokes instead of what it would take to bring a tree down with their, their primitive stone axes. Three communities uh, or villages uh, settled around where the two ones lived outside the camp. And, and three communities, if you will, of Sawi uh, camped and made their villages around the Tuan. Don spent hours listening to them learning their language, learning their customs, and trying in, in his primitive way to tell them God's truth about creation and the entrance of sin, the promise of a deliverer, and the life of Christ. But the Swahi weren't really used to listening to tales about other cultures, and they got bored until dawn came to the narrative about the crucifixion of Jesus, the Passion. And he got to the story of Judas. And well, they set up and they began to listen intently and ask for more. Uh, the story of Judah had a close relationship to them. His relationship to Christ and his betrayal caught a note within them. And they began to whistle and clap in an admiration. And then Don began to realize in their cultural treachery and deception was seen as a virtue. It was admirable. It was the stuff that legends were built around. And they valued not just cold-blooded murder, 
but the fattening with friendship is what they called it. To bring somebody in and flatter them and build them up and fatten them with friendship, all the time the unexpected victim didn't know what laid for him. And then they would tell of the delight that they would get out of the look of astonishment on the face of this friend when he realized that he was doomed to be killed and eaten by them. Kind of a grim story, isn't it? And the book has some grim stories in the beginning of it. Uh, they thought Judas uh, was the hero of the story. Uh, Don was astonished and chilled to, and, and he tried to explain that betrayal was evil, that Jesus was the Son of God, but he couldn't get that story through. He couldn't impress that lesson on them. And Don and his wife, Carol, knew that uh, God had to, in some way, reach and break through this culture and set themselves to hope for a new revelation. They began to pray how, and their life became very uneasy in this climate. Are we being fattened for the day when we are killed and eaten as well, if you can imagine? Well, the next day, after the story had been told, fighting broke out between the three different villages. That day, and for, for several days to come, Don urged them for peace. The Swahi villages usually kept some distance from each other for this very reason. And Don realized by having these three, three villages come and settle near him that those villagers were constantly being provoked to battle because that was the heart of their culture. Finally, he felt that they needed to leave. They needed to settle somewhere else so that the Swahi would not end up destroying themselves. When the Swahi found them packing up and tearing down their place and getting ready to, to move, they began to protest. They didn't want them to leave. They thought they were a good omen to them. They wanted them to stay. And discussions began, and the leaders from all the factions came to Don to assure him that they would make peace. Now, here's the heart of the story. The next day, the Swahi uh, group, uh, groups solemnly gathered and Don witnessed to his amazement, amazement that each man from the warring groups would bring one of his own children with a mother's weeping and exchange that child and give it to somebody in that group. And that group, their men would be giving one of their children into the arms of the other groups. Those in one group who would accept the child as a basis of peace were called to come and lay hands on him, and the process was repeated with the other group. Then each child was taken to their new adoptive home, never to return to their original home. You see, in that culture of violence and treachery, at some point the Sawi had found a way to prove sincerity and establish peace. If a man would actually give his own children, one of his sons or one of his children, to his enemy, then that man could be trusted. Now Don was horrified uh, that, that his call for peace had caused this kind of grief or this kind of thing to happen. But he soon began to realize the parallels between the Sawi peace child and God's sacrifice of his own son. And he began to tell them that Jesus was God's own peace child to all men. Judah, Judas lost his status at that point as a hero because harming a peace child was one of the worst things anyone could ever do. And they began to see the inadequacy of their best because peace in their culture only held as long as the peace child lived. When the peace child died, old animosities could revive, but because Jesus rose again and was eternal and never to die, the peace child would never die. And he gave, uh, uh, the peace child that was giving would never die, therefore it could never be broken. It took many months of understanding and conviction to begin to sink in. And even then, they were afraid of angering the demons by departing from tradition. But when God enabled Don and Carol to revive a Sawi tribesman who was near death, the Sawi took that as proof of the Tuan's God, 
that he was more powerful than any other god and they began to believe. Eventually, more than half of the Sawi became believers. Their language was reduced to writing and they were taught to read and the New Testament was translated and given to the people. Some of the Sawi went out and, and learned and were discipled to become teachers of their own people. Later, the, the, the Richardsons moved from that area, but there is a video and a story out there of how like, uh, oh, I want to say 40 years later, 30 years later or something, he and their three sons who grew up in the Sawi village went back to the village and saw many of those people who were still alive, who would have never, if they had never found Christ, they'd have probably died in battle, were still alive and Christ was prospering in their Sawi community and the communities were growing. That's your mission story for tonight. Let's go ahead and move to prayer. Father, we thank you that you, you have given us so many narratives and stories out there that where you have worked through our common ordinary people to do extraordinary things and how your gospel, how your word is penetrated deep into some of the darkest cultures in our world. That gives us hope, Lord, because we know that you are still a miracle-working, uh, almighty, saving God. And if you can do it in, in a culture like the Sawi, you can, you can do it again in the culture that we live in. Now, Father, we have these prayer requests that uh, we put out week to week, but we have new ones here that we don't want to forget. Father, we, uh, we do pray for uh, those that are in the path of Hurricane Laura, those that are, are facing these tropical storms this time of year that can be so devastating. It comes on the, the heels in the midst of this uh, coronavirus. And Lord, I pray, when, as Julia's asked, that we pray for the peoples of Louisiana who are going to get hit with this and, and all along the Gulf Coast and as it moves inland and, and the people that are going to be touched by this hurricane. We pray, Lord, that, uh, that you will be seen uh, and, and a spectacular, Lord, uh, in this situation and and Julia also has an unspoken request that we live before you and trust you with Sue who has this uncle who is 98 years old and and has now come down with the virus we know how at risk this gentleman is we pray your hand be laid upon him that your power be there and Lord we don't know what your intent is at the end of the day but we commit it all into your hands and Lord I know that Sue has been rocked many times by the loss of a loved one or a friend lately and we lift her up and pray that the comfort of Almighty God will be hers and Lord as Sherry has asked us uh, to, and we have been praying for her brother Mike uh, we thank you for the progress that has been made today with some improvement and the doctors hope that they can remove the tube tomorrow. We just lay he and Libby and the boys in your hand and know, Lord, that you have them in your care. We thank you, Father. And we do pray for Colby, this 22-year-old young man that we know that's friends of, of, uh, of, of uh, Tanya and, and Kirk and the kids. And Lord, as he went through this spinal surgery, this fusion, he's in so much pain, and we do pray that you will be with them. And Lord, as we go through the night, as other prayer requests come, might we be mindful to pray. And Lord, we do pray for the very spiritual battle that rages in our land now. And we do stand against the very principalities and power, the might, the dominion, the authorities in heavenly places, Lord, that would seek to bring further corruption to our land. We pray, and we pray, Lord, for those that are on the forefront of the battle as it comes to them, that, Lord, you will empower and strengthen, that your grace and mercy and love, Lord, will flood this land. Let us be beacons of truth, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Ah. Uh, all right, let's move on. Let's go back and uh, pick up kind of where we left off last week in uh, looking, oh, there's a picture of Don Richardson's. I didn't really do a good job of, of moving that forward. These are some pictures of the Swahi people, uh, Sawi people of Papua Indonesia, Paupa. Uh, so we're looking at uh, Paul's prayer 
in the first chapter of Ephesians where we began, and here I want us to look at verses 18 through 22. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of your calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ, when he raised him from the dead and seated it at his own right hand in heavenly places. As we've shared, this prayer is designated to readjust the way that we pray for one another, that we pray for the church. It is a prayer that is, is absolutely uh, necessary in the day in which we live, that the church would come to, to understand how much we value him and to value him more than anything else, that he would open our heart to the value of Christ and give us a deep understanding of these things. This prayer can reorient us to the things that we should long for in our own life and in our own church uh, and to understand and to desire uh, in, in the life of all believers. Paul lifts up this prayer for the Ephesian Christians and for you and me so that we would have what we need for our Christian life, that we would have a heart that knows God and is set on him and that desires him that we would have a heart that is comforted by the hope that only God can give. Don't we need that kind of hope today? Uh, as we, as Sue faces what she's facing with, with, with her uncle, as, uh, as others are facing the tribes, and people down in Louisiana or along the Gulf Coast are facing this storm. They need hope. The church needs hope in this day, Lord. As it's coming under attack, we need the hope that only God can give. A heart that can only be satisfied with the riches that, that God dis, uh, d bestows. We've been looking at Achan and, uh, and, and, and his sin, how he wasn't satisfied with God. He desired something more. Uh, he said his desire and thought the things of this world that he could capture for himself would meet the desire of his heart, and it did not. We need a heart that is only satisfied in the riches that God bestows rather than the fading riches of this world. And a heart that uh, gains strength from the power that only God can provide. Uh, so we looked at and began to look at this heart enlightenment. I pray that the eyes of their heart, Paul says in this prayer, I pray that the eyes of their heart would be enlightened. So he says, Lord God, give them heart enlightenment. Uh, let the deep desire of their heart be set on you, upon your truth. Make them to have a passion for you and for you alone, to long for you, for their hearts to love you above everything else, with all of their heart and all of their soul, all of their mind and strength, to want your glory. Give them heart enlightenment. Well, people, we need to be praying for just those things, for every believer we know and for our own life. Oh, God, enlighten my heart so I desire nothing more than you, that I find my satisfaction and contentment in you, as we talked about on Sunday morning. But Paul doesn't uh, just stop there. He goes on to say three things in particular that he wants. He talks about getting a grasp of the hope of his calling. In, a, in Ephesians 1, verse 18, the second part of that verse, he says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling. We need to be have that, that heart enlightenment so that we will know, that we know, that we know deep inside us what is the hope of his calling. He's praying that the Holy Spirit would give us a deep, and real and personal grasp of the hope that we have in his calling. You and I have a certain hope based upon God's eternal choice of each one of us. His effectual calling of us. His adopting us into the family. God has called you out of darkness. He's called me out of darkness into his marvelous light. And in doing so, he's given us a real and substantial and tangible hope in this fallen and messed up world. You see, we can't live the Christian life without 
hope. Has it ever struck you that how many hopeless people there are around you? I met a lady that, that really broke my heart yesterday. Uh, I think it was yesterday that I'd gone up to Safeway and I was coming out. This lady in front of me had talked, you know, nonstop, five minutes even after her groceries had checked out. And, and uh, you know, she would apologize for holding me up, holding up the line and there was only myself and another person in line. And then she'd keep talking. When I got to the check stand, the, the the clerk apologized. And you could tell in her conversation that there was such an air of hopelessness about this lady. And he said, that woman hasn't been out of her apartment in over five months. This is the first day that she has set foot out of her apartment. And I thought, oh Lord, how I grieve that there are so many people in the world. I'm not talking about the pandemic people. I'm not talking about fear of the virus. I think I think some people have every every right, and the wise thing is to have a healthy fear of the virus, especially if you are an at-risk person. It's very real. We understand that. But the hopelessness that was there, the despair that you heard in her voice, broke my heart. See, Paul is saying, I want you to have the eyes of your heart enlightened so that you will know by personal experience the hope, the real certain hope that God has given you, that we would live in that. What security does that bring us? When we really understand we live in that hope, such security. Now, I may do things that are, are, are common sense things to do to avoid certain things, but I do it with a sense of peace and security not out of fear and desperation. Paul knows that we can't go through this life without hope. You see, when all hope is gone, the last thing that comes is death. Paul knows that there are hopeless people in the world, but he also knows that every Christian ought to realize that he is filled with hope and that he is not without hope in this world. We need hope hope, my friends, and you and I need to be ones that, that give hope to people. Share the hope that we have. Be ready and see, be ready to give an answer for the hope that we have when asked. People, if there's one thing that we can share is to share hope with people, and as you share hope, Ultimately, you're going to be presenting to them the only source of hope, and that's Christ. When we look at our world, when we look at our city, when we look at our culture, there's much, I would think, to be hopeless about. In fact, the very, very often when, when people grow older in this life, they become bitter and cynical because there is just so much despair around them, so little hope. Can't you hear the despair crying out in our culture today? And it would seem the closer we get to that magical election day, the more despair is going to ring out to dishearten people. Oh, there's hope. Paul is saying no Christian need ever be in that kind of circumstance because by God, by his Holy Spirit, grounds us in the hope of our calling. God has called us from darkness to light. He has called us from bondage to freedom. He's called us from the dominion of Satan into the glorious dominion of his son, Jesus Christ. God has called us out of servitude to freedom from sons to become sons and daughters of a living God. There is every reason for us in that calling to be hopeful in this world. Our family has long been fans of J.R.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, his trilogy. Sherry first enlightened us to it. It was one of her favorite books as a teenager. And the first thing she did every summer was to commit herself to reading through the trilogy. That was her beginning of the summer uh, I never I, I've, I've read through them pretty much now all the way 
It took me years to do that. And then the movies came out. And the movies are great, but they don't fit up to the book. In, in, in Tolkien's fictional work, in The Lord of the Rings, uh, Galadriel is the elfin queen. In one scene in the movie and in the book, she gives a vial uh, that has some of the light of Arendelle uh, in it, and he gives it to this unlikely hero, Frodo. Frodo Baggins, this brave little hobbit. And when she gives him the vial of light from, from Arendelle, she says, here is a light that when all other lights go out, here is a light. Now, Tolkien wrote this as a Christian allegory. Uh, he was a very close friend and was instrumental in leading C.S. Lewis to the Lord. A profound Christian, and the Lord of the Rings is a Christian allegory. So here we see, wondrously displayed in a beautiful picture, that in inextinguishable hope that only God can give in this sin-darkened world. We need to pray that kind of hope, the realization of that hope for one another. And we need to pray for it just like Paul did, with all the urgency that we can. Oh, my friends, Christians need hope today, don't they? Wherever this broadcast goes out tonight, and I know that we're all the way to Georgia, and I know we're probably in Florida, and I know that we're in Arizona and, and, and New York and, and, and Texas and many other places as well as here in Oregon and in our area. But wherever it goes out and in the days in the future, there are Christians in trial. We need to pause frequently and constantly and say, Lord God, in the midst of his or her trial, open enlighten their eyes, his eyes, her eyes, and open their, the, the enlightenment of their heart that he or she may see what is the hope of their calling. Oh, you see, my friends, I sent out that article and that letter last night so that you could get it and you could read it. It isn't a, a, a condemnation of governments or entities or the authorities that God has given us over us. It is a warning of what is happening, certainly. It is to alert us that, uh, that certain privileges that are, are given to us in the Constitution are slowly being eroded away. Certainly that is there. It is a call to remember facts and things of history so that we don't fall into the trap of repeating those very things. It is to give us to understand how over the course of the last 60 years, the church has pretty much been silent as first one thing and after another within our cultural dynamic has been been drastically, drastically changed without even a whimper from, from the Christian. We have sat silent and we have watched the very, the very culture that we love begin to disintegrate. It's not to, to tear people apart, it's just a fact. It's not to say, oh, I prefer the good old days to today. That's not what this is about at all. It's about an understanding of identifying the time in which we live and understanding what God calls us to do and understand the nature of the spiritual battle and to pray. And that's my call. That's my desire is that we as a people will become fervent in our prayer. And part of that prayer is if, if, if that if the battle should come to our doorstep, oh, that we would be strong in the Lord, in the strength of his might, 
that we would put on the full armor of God, not the armor of men, but the armor of God, and we would stand firm. And we would not lose our witness. As I shared with somebody the other day, I don't want to get to the end of my race and fall by the wayside and be disqualified. I want to finish the race well. May we. I'm going to stop here because to go further into the next thing that Paul prays for here would to take us way beyond the time that we should be uh, wrapping things up. We have these prayer requests that are out there. Sherry had just said an unspoken for each member of our family. And I would I, I would I would I would say yes to that. That uh, we pray. I, I appreciate your prayers for our family. Uh, the things that they are going through. Uh, Michaela's gonna be going through some uh, medical tests uh, and uh, we I'd like you to be praying for her, you know, during this time. Pray. Pray that we will be able to stand and lovingly just present Christ to the world that God has given us. I can't tell you how much I love you all and what it means to be your shepherd, to be your pastor. I love you with all my heart. And Pam, if you will, uh, give me your email address. I will be more than glad to send you a copy of the article that, uh, that we put out. Would you join me as we pray? Almighty, wonderful, glorious Father, God of our Lord Jesus Christ, Father of all comfort, Lord of all grace and mercy, oh, that you would open up our understanding to the depths of the living hope to which you have called us. Lord, that we would know that it's not just a hope that leads to wishful thinking, but it is a hope that goes beyond the hope this world has. It's so deeply profound that it leads us to understand the absolute assurance that we have that your word, every word that you have spoken, is absolute and true and will come about. And that we can place our lives strictly upon the word of God and know that we will stand firm and that, Lord, we will bring honor to your name. We have that hope, hope that is, is embodied in and birthed through our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Hope that we are born into when we come into faith in Christ. Hope that rests in the assurance of God's plan and purpose and word for us. Lord, we come. We come in that living hope, knowing that that hope says that when we pray anything according to your will, that you hear us. And we know that if you hear us, that we have that which we have requested. Now, Father, I lift up to you again those that have been mentioned, the unspoken requests that Julia and Sherry have mentioned to us. We pray for Pam's knees and for Dan's uh, pain that, that he is in. Father, we pray that, uh, that you will be with Sue's uh, uncle as, uh, as he's now sick and down with, with, with the coronavirus. We pray for those that are being bombarded by the storm, that there be peace and safety and comfort, and, and that, Lord, you will bring to, to their heart that deep and abiding hope that you have given us. I pray, Lord, for for those pastors across our nation and those churches that have uh, have come under uh, uh, restriction and uh, even to to the the threat or even to the incarceration of, of of people within the church of pastors, we pray, Lord, that by your grace and that your mercy, that that Lord, you will get glory even in that. That Father, they'll not be raging in anger, but that Father, they will be reaching in love. 
Father, when, when, when Christ went to the cross, he didn't rage in anger, but he, he shared forgiveness and love and mercy. May we be of that type, Father, that we don't shake our fist and rail at authorities, but that, Lord, we love them and that we pray for them and that we, we seek for their best and we seek that the eyes of their understanding, the, the blindness in their eyes, the scales in their eyes will be lifted, that they may see the glory of God in Christ Jesus, that they'll see the wonder of the gospel, that they themselves will surrender to the hand of Almighty God. We pray for those that are in authority, that, Lord, you will put a blockade between the, the powers of evil and darkness that would seek to persuade, and that, Father, your will would be done through them, even as your will was done through Artaxerxes and, and through Nebuchadnezzar and through others, that, Lord, your will will be done through them, that your glory will be manifest, that your name will be exalted in this land. Father, bring to us revival, true spiritual awakening, Lord, we pray in the name and under the power and authority of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray amen and amen and amen. May God bless you all. May he keep you, may he strengthen you, may he empower you, may he infuse you with a living hope that absolutely gives you the assurance of all in your life. May you be blessed. Be a blessing to others. God bless.